Inflammation and inflammatory diseases are well known and well understood. And indeed, inflammatory diseases affect two-thirds of Americans late in life. But often the role of iron in inflammation is never mentioned. And in this vid video, we're going to correct that omission. Okay, so let's first look at what the inflammatory diseases are. While the two highest are heart disease and diabetes type 2, this affects something like 150 million Americans, uh, often l later in life. Then you've got things like lactose intolerance, which is actually dependent on your ethnic origin. So it affects something like 30 million to 50 million Americans, for example. Now the next one is iron, excess iron. I'm actually going to cheat by mentioning iron twice in this list. But this one is just too much iron. Because what we generally think is that there is too little iron. But this really affects young people below 20 or in their 20s. Young women often are deficient in iron and that can be up to, up to 10 to 15 percent. But what isn't often explained is that an equal number of people have too much iron. Something like nearly 15 percent of people have too much iron and this is like 45 million Americans. And we'll go into this in more detail in a minute. Then gluten intolerance has only become uh, well known in the last few years and is still disputed a little bit. But there's something like 20 million Americans with gluten intolerance. Then uh, there's a gene mutation called the MTHFR gene which causes folate deficiency and taking vitamin B12 will help here and this affects quite significantly large numbers of people. Then you have uh, iron overload which is uh, repeating iron again but it's specific to about 1.25 percent of the population which is still 4 million people in the US and is caused by a genetic mutation which causes not to be able to control the amount of iron in, in our bodies and this is something I suffer from and is what got me interested in this whole subject. Then you have thyroid problems, uh, over, overactive thyroid or it's called hypothyroidism uh, affects 6.6 .6 million Americans and then the, the, the lowest on this list that I'm going to talk about now is lupus uh, which affects about uh, 1.5 million Americans, so it's mostly women. Now let's look at this diagram. It shows the what I call the cause and effect tree for inflammation. And a cause and an effect is quite a strange thing. Within the human body is more often than not confused and misinterpreted by doctors. It is complicated because there's often a change of causes and effects. And additionally, there can be feedback loops where the effect links back to the cause. These two complications are particularly true for inflammation. We show a typical cause and effect tree in this picture below for inflammation. And further, we spell out the role of pure iron in the inflammation story and is nearly always ignored, although it's not highly significant when it really is. Now, looking at the diagram at the bottom, you've got the diseases as I've just mentioned. These are actually the, effectively the symptoms of inflammation and the causes can be all these things at the top, including iron. But when you get to the disease, you actually don't know which of the causes has actually caused it. And in fact, the reality is it's going to be a mixture of all the causes. And so when you say this person has heart disease and the cause is inflammation. Inflammation is not the cause. The cause is probably something to do with their diet, their gut biome, whether or not they've had a virus or a bacteria and how much iron is in their body. And it's all those things, not just one thing. Clearly inflammation can be caused by these large number of things, but we're particularly interested in the role of iron 
that, that it takes in this in a number of ways. First, iron enters the body through the food eaten and usually in a biochemical, biochemical form. However, when iron is added to foods for uh, alleged nutritional reasons, the iron is more often than not added as pure iron. Pure iron is highly toxic in conjunction with gluten intolerance. It can enter the bloodstream directly and cause havoc by inducing inflammation directly from the creation of these reactive oxygen species. The pure iron reacts with natural small amounts of hydrogen peroxide in the body, resulting in hydroxyl ions, which are highly damaging to the cells it comes across and cause inflammation. The body always has some natural pure iron because the immune system of a healthy person can control how much iron there is. But if a person has hemochromatosis, for example, which is uh, I causes iron overload, this is not the case. Meanwhile, there are many other factors involved in the creation of inf inflammation. Its main existence is due to the immune system attacking foreign invaders such as viruses and bacteria. The side effect of this is that it can also attack close by healthy tissue. The immune system will also attack milk products if a person cannot process lactose and this also causes inflammation. Once a cell is damaged it can effectively stop working but is left in this in a state called the senescent state. Senescent cells can infect close by cells making them senescent too and causing further inflammation. An example is when a particular hair uh, goes grey Often it's the, the hair's hair roots next to it that also go grey. There are mechanisms to remove senescent cells, but I won't address that. I'll address that in a separate video. Let's also look at this feedback loop, at which I've called inflammaging. This is a term that's been invented by the people doing research on ageing and what ageing is. And what ageing is, is just cell damage causing further inflammation. And it is this inflammation feedback loop called inflammation which is causing it. So for each disease that we have, an inf inflammatory disease, it feeds back and also causes the immune system to respond to it. This is effectively a built-in fault which builds over as you get older and older. The result is something called autoimmune responses. This is the immune system attacking uh, the body because as more damage happens more inflammation and, and more aging occurs and this eventually uh, causes to die from old age. One of the things the body can actually do is control the amount of inflammation by removing iron from the inflamed areas and it does this by converting iron to ferritin and reducing the inflammation. It effectively reduces the number of reactive oxygen species. You also, as I'll explain in another video, you can change your diet and help repair these damaged cells. So the takeaway from this is we're all affected to some degree as we get older by these inflammatory diseases. And it's impossible to say what is the root cause of the inflammation in each case. In reality, it's actually a mixture of reasons. And this diagram is actually showing you those, those possible mixtures, how it could fit together. And point was that iron is very significant in this story, both as either iron excess, because it's been built up in the body because of old age, and for the 1.25% of the population, that's 4 million Americans, with the most common genetic disease called hemochromatosis. It's significant as it can be a big contributor to all or some of these inflammatory diseases. Another point is that other root causes such as diabetes, gluten and lactose intolerance are also genetic risks. 
Now comes the interesting part. Since all these diseases are mostly age dependent, and which ones we suffer from are dependent on our genes, I want to ask the question, can we predict, given the knowledge of our DNA, what age you will suffer from one or some of these diseases? Clearly lifestyle, i.e. what we eat, comes into this too, but assuming most people have similar lifestyles, can we infer from genes what age someone will start suffering from these inflammatory diseases? Now, I run a website called checkiron.com, which helps people that are suffering from hemochromatosis. It's been running for 12 months and I've been collecting their DNA data and asking them when they got symptoms. We then use machine learning techniques to learn and then infer from new DNA sets when someone will get symptoms. To start with, I was just looking at the genes involved in hemochromatosis disease, and this worked well for the extreme cases when people got inflammatory disease in their 20s, but it worked less well for the weaker forms of hemochromatosis. And we discovered from the data, it was things like diabetes type 2 disease that were having a significant effect on the age of s at symptoms. Simply because all these symptoms of inflammatory disease are indistinguishable for the patient and the doctor treating the patient, the result is that currently for people with hemochromatosis mutations, we can predict a plus or minus 12 years when someone will get bad symptoms. Furthermore, since hemochromatosis is entirely treatable if caught early enough, we can say what age this preventable treatment should be taken. This approach could save hundreds of thousands of lives each year of Americans suffering from hemochromatosis and not knowing it. Furthermore, since this disease runs in families, then those that detect the issue could suggest to other family members they should check. I am releasing this video in June 2020 on Hemochromatosis Awareness Week. Awareness of hemochromatosis and use of DNA could save millions of lives over the next 10 to 20 years. Please tell your friends and relatives about CheckIron.com. It's free and anonymous. It uses DNA data from Ancestry, 23andMe, MyHeritage or Family Tree DNA, and it will tell you if you are at risk of suffering from hemochromatosis and it will predict the age you could get symptoms. Please try it, like this video, subscribe to the channel called Iron Could Kill You and share with your friends and relatives. You could save lives and thank you for listening.